Manideep sir, is a YouTube link uh, open for you? Please check. Yeah, yeah, it's working. Yeah, I will check once. I changed it now, actually. Please check it out. Yeah, yeah. Akash sir's uh, screen is visible in the YouTube. Oh, it's done live. Yeah, it's the time zone pretty. I hope uh, all participants have joined back. So let's start the session, second session with the introduction of our speaker, Dr. Prakash Yadav, sir. I'm going to introduce you Dr. Prakash Yadav, who is working as Associate Professor in Mechanical Engineering Department at SRM University. Dr. Prakash Yadav has completed his UG and PG in Government College of Engineering, Pune, and Doctor of Philosophy at University of Mississippi. Coming to his career journey, he worked as customer support engineer at Kirloskar Brothers Limited and worked for six years as assistant professor in Pune and completed postdoc fellow at University of Delaware, USC. Later, he worked as research scientist at Center for Composite Materials at University of Delaware, USA for two years and given his service at Humans Research Pune as senior engineer for two years and worked as lead scientist for seven years at GE Global Research Bangalore. During his journey, he has done research on several areas like computational mechanics, experimental mechanics, fiber reinforced composites, manufacturing composites, like so many. And he published research papers in several international journals. He has total five US patents. Along with this, he has membership in American Society for Mechanical Engineers, American Society for Composites, Society of Experimental Mechanics, and Indian Society for Technical Education. For his numerous research in several areas, he has received several awards and fellowships from GE Global, Government of South Africa, University of Mississippi, Indian Foundation and Ichalan Tree in Foundation and from Government of India also. Sir, it is our honor to welcome you for the FDP on research developments of nanocomposites and smart materials in the aerospace industry. Thank you very much, sir. And we are heartily welcome you to present your presentation. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Okay. Uh, can you hear me right right way and can you can you see me also? Yes, yes, sir. You are, you are visible and audible, sir. Okay. Let's start. Okay, so um, uh, as uh, I've been introduced right now, so I worked in uh, General Electric uh, Bangalore company uh, for a long time. And uh, I was part of many activities there, like uh, design of the composite structures for aircraft engine. And I'm going to talk about uh, those things here. So basically, uh, fiber reinforced composite structures uh, with application in aircraft engine. Aircraft engine. So uh, to focus on one component, uh, I'm going to talk about the fan blade uh, and the design issues in the fan blade. Okay. So let's move ahead. Okay. Just a minute. Okay. So uh, let me talk about the fan blade uh, historical development first. Uh, uh, as you can see, uh, all the aircraft engines, uh, the front end of the aircraft engines, so there are 16 to 18 uh, fan blades are there, okay? And uh, use of the fan blade, as you can uh, know very well, that uh, it creates the huge thrust. It helps create the huge thrust uh, for the engine, okay? So uh, some part of the air that is sucked in because of this fan, that goes to the engine, but uh, most of the air is bypassed and it creates the huge thrust for the engine. Okay, so this is the use of the fan blade. So as you can see, all the uh, current generation aircraft engines have fan blades installed at the front of the engine. 
so historical development is uh, initially all those fan blades were made uh, using aluminum alloys okay so as the various companies were trying to develop different materials so g was also involved in developing this uh, fan blade um, uh, to be made from uh, fiber reinforced composite structures okay so eventually what happened is uh, uh, around uh, 2000 year 2000 they were able to develop this uh, composite fan blade and then uh, successfully developed and uh, they kind of commissioned in some engines okay this fan blade but uh, along the development, uh, the development went on and on. Although they were commissioned in some engines, there were some issues and uh, the design was uh, re-modified again and again and again. Uh, so when I was working in GEs, I was part of this uh, design and development of these fan blades. I mean, further development, like how to make them better, or more efficient, uh, more reduction in weight, like lightweight and uh, some other things, uh, how to make this uh, current fan blades better. So I'm going to talk about those things. So basically, the approximate size of this fan blade, uh, if we talk about, is uh, generally, uh, let's say, a little bit, the length is a little bit more than one meter, OK? And width is approximately 0.4 meter or something. And thickness is maybe around, uh, let's say, uh, it ranges from 10 to 20 millimeter thickness. So actually, thickness varies all around the cross section. So if you cut the fan blade and uh, see the cross section of the fan blade, you will see that uh, at the tip, uh, the thickness is almost almost around zero. So maybe like one or two millimeter at the, at the tips, uh, I mean, at the left edge and the right edge. And in between, uh, the thickness varies. So maybe at the center of the blade, the thickness is highest. And then as you go to the left edge or right edge, the thickness reduces. Okay, uh, I'm talking about the cut section. Also, along the length, also thickness varies. So along the width, width, along the length, the thickness keeps on varying. So how do you design these kind of structures and uh, make them better? OK, so uh, let's talk about it. OK, so to talk about the uh, design criteria for fan blade, uh, of course, uh, you must be knowing by this time, the previous speaker also may have said, that uh, uh, the bus strike is a very important criteria in fan blade design, uh, particularly for aircraft uh, engine design, uh, bus strike is a very, very important criteria. So what is the specifier? What is this bus strike basically? What is the specifier? Okay. The uh, damage tolerance. So uh, there is an organization called FAA, Federal Aviation uh, Organization is there in US and uh, they specify some guidelines for this uh, uh, bus strike of fan blade. So if four pound bird is impacting uh, at certain height from sea level to 8,000 feet within that range, impacting on the aircraft engine, no significant damage is allowed. Okay. And uh, also the, uh, the aircraft should be able to land safely without any damage. Also, uh, there's another requirement, eight pound bird impacting at uh, sea level to 8,000 feet height, uh, certain damage is allowed, but height, right? still should be able to land safely on the ground. Okay, so these are the requirements. So then how, how, do, you, how do you satisfy all these requirements? Of course, there is a, a set of analysis. Uh, there is a design space. Design space in the sense that uh, uh, for all the loading requirements like four pound bird, a six pound bird, eight pound bird, at different velocities, at the ground level, at 3,000 feet level, at 8,000 feet level. Also the relative speed. Relative speed in the sense that uh, uh, aircraft is cruising at certain speed. So that is the basically uh, speed of the bird. Uh, and also uh, and also the fan is rotating at 3000 RPM. So there's a, a linear speed and there's also a rotational speed. So the relative speed becomes uh, too high because if you do the calculation of this relate, uh, linear speed plus relative speed of that, uh, linear speed plus rotational speed of the fan blade, ultimately the relative, relative speed that you arrive at that is very high. Okay, so you have to do the bus track analysis uh, using uh, standard simulation softwares. Also come up with uh, uh, the, the, you have to follow the guideline, how the analysis has to be done, what kind of material has to be used, what, what kind of loading condition has to be used, all those conditions, and you have to explore the design space and prepare detailed documentation. Then this uh, FAA, FAA persons uh, will come and uh, check all these results of the analysis, and they have the experience, they can, 
uh, they can see whether your uh, design qualifies the bus strike or not. But that is not the only thing. Of course, uh, uh, certain certain breads you have to manufacture and uh, take it to the test validation site. So uh, the testing, as you can see, the right hand side figure, it shows the test rig for test rig for the aircraft engine pamphlets. So as you can see, the engine is uh, hanging there in the test site. And uh, there are pamphlets front side. Uh, there are pamphlets installed. And uh, on the left side, there's a gun. Okay, the gun shows this uh, gelatin birds. Okay, or real birds also sometimes. And uh, as they shoot the bird, and the fan is rotating at 3,000 RPM, it hits the fan blade, composite fan blade, or metal fan blade. And uh, then they evaluate the damage. Okay, this is the test side. So uh, the thing is. Uh, uh, if you like uh, explore all the design space, like and like you prepare, you make like these thousands of fan blades and then test them uh, under this test rig. It is going to cost you a lot, huge huge amount of expenses. Maybe like uh, one test costs like uh, uh, maybe half million dollar, something like that. So it's very very costly. So so that's what you cannot do everything there. Uh, so that's why the simulation results are also very important. Simulation explores all the design space, and certain cases are uh, manufactured and tested. Okay, so left side you can see the simulations for this uh, pamphlet test. So I'm I'm going to talk about uh, certain things like uh, okay, so uh, there was one particular uh, project that uh, the industry was working on. So uh, they tried to reduce the weight of the pamphlet. So how do you reduce the weight of the plant bed? So the one idea that we came up with is uh, maybe we can use uh, the uh, polymeric foam inserts inside this uh, carbon fiber plant bed. So if you look at the plant bed, this is basically made from uh, IM7 carbon uh, and epoxy. So it's like, uh, and it's made up like a layer by layer laminated composite. Okay. And uh, it's made using uh, autoclave, hand layup and autoclave. So, Basically, uh, it's it's a solid composite, carbon composite, solid composite. So thickness maybe around goes like a 20 millimeter at the center or something like that. So can we insert? Can we use some kind of uh, structural form insert inside so that uh, weight can be further reduced, but without affecting the performance of this uh, fan blade? Performance in the sense that under the mechanical loading and also under this uh, bus strike loading, uh, it should still qualify. That was the that was the condition. So, so th this is what we try to explore here: the uh, use of this uh, embedded form inserts. So, to talk about that, so main objective was to use uh, polyurethane uh, form inserts inside the carbon composite uh, fan blades to reduce the weight by five percent, but without affecting the mechanical performance. So, as you can see. Uh, uh, there's one example given there. So where in the image you can see uh, there is a yellow, yellow is the polymeric form insert, okay, or urethane form insert, and the black part is all carbon composite. And uh, this is one sample made and then uh, one example was uh, manufactured and it was tested and it was found that uh, from the tip of the foam, uh, delamination is occurring and it is propagating to the end. Okay, so so basically, uh, this is what observed. So then project was basically what to do, uh, how, how to make this idea feasible, okay? What different things you can do to make this idea feasible? What are the uh, design space? What are the design approach? Uh, what are the alternative ideas that to make this feasible? Okay. So as we talked about, this is made up IMC18551 carbon epoxy composite and uh, mostly the zero and 45 layers there. Uh, so design approach. So uh, we decided like wh what we should do. So let's you know design some representative coupon models, okay? With and without form inserts, this embedded inserts, okay? And then explore the design space. Like what, what different things we can do uh, in those coupons using the APA structure analysis, okay? Uh, what can we do basically? And then based on that, uh, we'll find the promising cases. Like, like if you have a certain idea, you can implement in the Scopon's uh, models in APA and come up with the promising cases. And only for the promising cases, we will manufacture those uh, Scopon's okay, and test them 
under this uh, represent, representative boundary conditions and see how they perform. And if the coupons perform better in those representative boundary condition testing, then we can actually manufacture a couple of the blades, a couple of blades for most promising cases and uh, test them under the test rig. This is what uh, generally the design approach for this kind of blades because uh, you cannot afford to you know, make a blade every time and test it. That's like half million dollar. So you play with the coupons basically. Okay. You play with the coupons and find the promising cases in coupons by trying out like maybe hundreds of coupons. And uh, then you can implement that uh, into actual coupons, manufacture actual coupons, test them. And then you can go to the blades. This is what the approach is. So, yeah, so uh, coupon design. So as you can see in the previous uh, picture here, the internal laminar kind of failure was observed. Okay? So that was the focus here. The coupon has to be designed in such a way that uh, the interlaminar design, uh, interlaminar kind of failure should occur there in the coupon. So uh, if we make a coupon and uh, let's assume that uh, it is subjected to four point staggered bend condition. So as you can see, uh, this is a simple coupon, which is subjected to four point staggered bend condition. Now staggered means what? Uh, if no staggered means what? Let me explain to you. Staggered means what? It's an annotation there. Yeah, so, yeah. So basically, uh, let's say this is the normal uh, four point bend. Normal four point bend is like this. If you know normal four point bend, and the uh, coupon bends like this, basically like this, coupon bend like this, normal four point bend. So this is a staggered four point bend. Okay, this is slightly different. So here, what we do is uh, uh, the coupon is going to bend in what way here, like this. Coupon is going to bend like this and like this. Coupon going to going to bend like this. So, what are we achieving by using this stagger per point bending? So, we actually uh, using the analysis we compare this uh, regular per point bend and the stagger per point bend, and we found that uh, in this particular region that is uh, inside the circle that is highlighted here. So, inside this particular circle, what we observed is uh, uh, the interlaminar shear strains uh, were very high. So basically, it's like uh, forcing forcing the coupon to uh, have a maximum interlaminar shear strain in certain region. So this is what we did, uh, and decided to use this design. Okay. So tip of the insert is the most sensitive part. So as you can see here in the previous, uh, if you look at the previous slide, the tip of the insert was the most sensitive part from where these uh, interlaminar uh, cracks were developing. So, so we decided that the insert insert may be uh, embedded in the coupon in such a way that uh, in this region the tip should come, the tip should come in this region. That was decided. Okay. So let me clear all the lines. Yeah. So going ahead. So approximate size of these coupons, if we talk about, uh, it was just like uh, th thirty centimeter long. Okay and uh, a representative layup uh, was used which was similar to the blade layup okay but this is a constant thickness of course not like the blade the blade which is having a very variable thickness but here is constant thickness okay? uh, just to have a, a representative coupon in a standard uh, our uh, utm setting okay you go to universal test machine and you have the four point bend setup and you do the stagger four point bend okay so width was one inch and the thickness was depending upon the number of layers thickness. Okay. So yeah, so talk about this uh, APA simulation. So uh, of course, uh, uh, for the coupon analysis, ANSI solid element model was used. Uh, uh, its composite layer was modeled separately. Okay. And uh, proper local orientations were defined. As you know, every layer is having a different orientation in the blade. Accordingly, uh, we we assign the local coordinates and we uh, oriented each and every layer. Uh, actual layer was used. Uh, uh, it is a combination of zeros and 45s. Uh, then uh, local orientations were defined. Uh, under stagger per point bend load and bond conditions, stress analysis was performed. Okay. So this is the sample uh, stress and strain diffusion plot. 
So interlaminar stress al uh, along through thickness line was monitored. So what we, what we did is we used to monitor, we should take the section of this uh, coupon and uh, uh, monitor the strain variation along this thickness, okay? Uh, like through thickness variation, basically. Uh, two elements away from the tip. As uh, there was singularity occurring at the tip, so we are not taking the tip element, we are taking two elements away from the tip. Okay. And use as a parameter to compare all the cases that we uh, tried here, different different cases. Okay, so we'll talk about uh, some of the things that we tried. Okay, so let's assume that this is a tip shape like this, okay? the tip shape so that tip shape can be like uh, having a different taper level so this is one example here uh, 1 is to 8 if you go to the next uh, kind of you know tip here it can be 2 is to 1 it can be 1 is to 1 it can be 4 is to 1 like different uh, levels of taper for the for the tip and also uh, if you talk about this uh, blunting blunting in the sense that uh, uh, how many plies are terminating at the end so uh, that's what is called as blunting. So you should, I'll show you some demonstration here. Blunting means what? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So uh, if these plies are coming like this, one, two, three, and four. So four plies are ending at the end. Okay. And there is this tip here like this. So that means uh, you have a blunting of uh, one, two, three, four. There are four plies. One, two, three, four. Four plies are blunting at the end, okay? Like this four ply termination, or you can say eight ply termination, or 12 ply termination, or 22 ply termination, like this. So basically, uh, all these plies are coming at the end and ending there. So four plies are ending, that means it's uh, called as the four ply termination. Then another case is eight ply termination, third case is 12 ply termination, then 22 ply termination. Like this different cases we tried, and uh, along with the taper level. So we varied this taper level and Upper level and the bluntness level like this uh, to reach at some uh, results, okay, the conclusions. So as you can see, uh, as you vary these uh, different kind of prior terminations, we get different results. Uh, different results in the sense that if you monitor this uh, interlaminar uh, stress variation through thickness, you can see that uh, due to the different prior termination, you can see the uh, stress level and the tip is varying. Okay. Also, uh, as you change the taper of this tip here, so the taper level also has an effect, and you can see the maximum stress level, interlaminar stress level, is uh, varying at the tip. Okay. So, yeah. So going ahead. Okay. So. Yeah, so again, uh, uh, combination of the brandless level and the taper variation, that also we tried in the sense that uh, if you keep like, uh, if you take one case of the prior termination, that is uh, 12 plies ending at the end, and then you try to vary the taper level like this. You fix one parameter and you try to vary the other parameter. So the first parameter was like uh, prior termination that we fixed it and other parameter is like uh, taper variation that we varied. So that also give, give like uh, different results. Like uh, at the tip, you can see the maximum uh, inflammatory stress level is varying. Okay. Then uh, going ahead, there are some more cases we tried. Like, uh, uh, so what we found here is uh, when, when you use the polymeric form and suppose the curing did not happen properly. So some of the cracks, uh, that were that were already in the coupon, uh, in the uh, foam part, like polymeric foam part, it was already cracked like this, uh, vertical cracks. So how do you model that vertical crack? I mean, in case the curing is not proper, then this, this cracks will be existing there. So how do you model this uh, cracks there? Then we try to, you know, uh, model those cracks using duplicate nodes there and, uh, then we saw that it doesn't have significant uh, impact on the uh, interlaminar shear stress level of the tip. Also, there were some other cases like uh, you can see uh, use of the soft laminates like glass near the tip. So, 
So as you can see, uh, the maximum stress or strain concentration is mostly occurring at the tip. Then uh, how about, uh, although this uh, blade is made of composite, uh, carbon composite, how about we can insert some glass flies there, like glass is a softer material compared to carbon. So if we insert this uh, softer material near the tip, what is going to happen? This is one of the case that we tried. Then also, yeah, so if you insert the glass laminate near the tip, uh, it shows that the reduction in the maximum stress level was achieved. Okay. Then again, there was some more uh, parameters, okay. Like uh, if you use the other layer between the inserts and laminates, like uh, this is the embedded form insert. And these are the carbon laminates. So if you if you kind of you know put a adhesive there, so what is going to happen? The effect of this addition of this adhesive, uh, it did not have much impact on the interlaminar shear stress level at the tip. Okay. Also continuous ply. So continuous ply. What is the definition of continuous ply? Basically, so if you have a foam insert, okay, and uh, uh, suppose you you take a ply and wrap wrap the foam insert. Uh, uh, you basically take the ply, uh, carbon composite ply, and wrap the port foam insert around it. Okay, so uh, it, it's like a wrapped foam insert, and then you put the foam insert inside the uh, carbon composite. So if you do that, uh, what is going to have the effect of that? So use of continuous ply around the foam insert slightly reduces the maximum shear stress near the tip. Okay. Then uh, going forward, we thought about uh, uh, why only uh, one embedded foam insert? Why can't we have more number of uh, multiple foam inserts? Maybe like two or maybe like three around the cross section. As you can see here, one example is shown here, like uh, instead of uh, one single big one foam insert, can we have the multiple foam insert like this? Okay. So we try like two foam inserts, three foam inserts like that. Uh, larger spacing between the two inserts lower the shear stress. Drop due to blunting tips, not as significant as that in single insert. Then uh, going forward, instead of this double insert, we thought, can we use the multiple inserts, multiple embedded inserts, polymeric inserts? Then, uh, yeah, this is the example shown here. Uh, as you can see, uh, we, we try to increase the uh, this number of uh, uh, embedded form inserts. Uh, we started from five embedded foam inserts, then nine, then 11, then more than that like this. And uh, we saw that uh, we cannot go further beyond uh, 12 inserts because there is not enough space there. The space is uh, very, very less, okay? And uh, if you increase the, like if you keep on increasing the number of embedded foam inserts, the thickness of the foam insert will also go down to a paper thin foam insert. That is also not possible. So within this 25 millimeter thickness, uh, we have to play around. So Maximum foam inserts we can do is maybe like uh, 10, 11 foam inserts. So we tried like five, nine, and 11 uh, foam inserts. And we found that uh, it it did show some promise. It showed the much lower shear stress near the tip. Okay. Because uh, instead of single, single big one, you are distributing the uh, foam inserts into multiple, multiple embedded foam inserts like this. So your weight, weight reduction target will be achieved. And as well, uh, you don't see the stress, stress concentration as high as uh, you've seen earlier. Okay. This is what the uh, target was. So also there is, uh, uh, suppose, suppose you take a fabric, fabric in the sense like um, uh, bi-directional fabric, basically one fabric, you take one fabric and wrap around the foam insert and uh, uh, wrap around the foam insert and use it, okay. And also you can have like kind of a wing extension, uh, that wrapping that you have fabric wrapping. Can we have some kind of wing extension at the end? Okay. And uh, uh, how much should be the length of this wing extension? Is it like uh, uh, one millimeter, two millimeter, five millimeter? How much you can have? Uh, that also different parameters that we tried. Thickness of the fabric wrap insert also. This fabric wrap also we kind of varied and check whether it's going to have effect. And uh, wrap thickness, yes, wrap thickness shows the effect here. Shear stress can go down. Also, the uh, uh, extension, uh, the extension uh, wing, wing extension length also plays a role. That also shows some effect. Okay. So these are the different things that we tried uh, uh, 
we explore in the design space for the coupons. And then we manufacture uh, some of the coupons with these promising cases that I'll show you. Yeah. Okay, there was one more uh, case that we tried. Uh, how about like uh, uh, we insert these uh, vertical fibers inside the uh, embedded foam insert, okay? So that uh, this foam insert can become a little bit stronger. Uh, this also we tried vertical fibers, reinforced foam model. So basically, we have an embedded foam, but that foam will be reinforced with fibers. So if you try like this, what is going to happen? So this also we tried uh, fiber bundles going through the thickness of the foams in vertical direction like this. So that adds to the uh, stiffness of the foam, and then uh, so maybe we can achieve the both the objective. First objective is to reduce the weight of the blade, and second objective is of course uh, to not have the stress concentration there. So it also showed some promise uh, that uh, there is lower shear stress near the tip. So this is like uh, summarizing uh, all the cases together here. Okay. So uh, as you can see, this uh, various kind of prior terminations uh, showed some promise from like, uh, uh, as you can see, uh, some cases were showing like 21 uh, KSI. And uh, as you uh, revise the designs, it went down to almost 13 KSI. Similarly, the taper, variation of taper showed like uh, promise from 14 to 12, then combination of these two went further down. Then use of this wing, extended wings, use of this uh, plus minus 45 wing, uh, fabric wrap and wings, uh, then reinforced, reinforced uh, embedded foam insert, then the soft material at the tip, okay, use of the soft material at the tip, and also dual forms, and there's multiple form also. So as you can see, some of the cases uh, were showing promise here, uh, like very low interlamellar shear stresses. This is interlamellar shear stress. So very low interlamellar shear stresses, that means uh, probably they are not gonna fail uh, as compared to this uh, very high shear stress material. Okay. So yeah, so some of these coupons were uh, manufactured. Uh, coupon panels were manufactured uh, using again this hand layup and uh, uh, carbon carbon fiber IM7855 one epoxy uh, prepex and hand layer. They are manufactured and uh, also with and without foam insert to compare the performance. So some coupons were without the foam insert, some coupons with foam insert, and also those promising cases only, like uh, what are uh, shown earlier. Some of the promising cases they are manufactured and then precise coupons were cut through uh, the panels using water jet cutting. And as you can show in the uh, picture down there that they were tested under four point bench stagger condition like this, so that uh, uh, we, we can monitor the uh, shear, shear strength there, shear strength there at this uh, tip there and see how the coupons are failing. Okay. So based on that, uh, based on the coupon results, again, uh, some promising cases uh, were found and those promising cases some actual blades were manufactured like that using embedded foam insert and uh, burst strike test was also performed. Okay. So this is what the uh, design approach that uh, industry uses because uh, as I told you um, initially only that uh, they cannot, cannot make a blade for every case and test it. It costs like huge amount of money. So basically you, you always go ahead with the coupons. You probably design the coupon in a right way uh, like simulating the actual uh, load conditions, uh, the way coupon bend in actual real blade. So why why are we using the bend, bending here? Because if you look at this actual blade, yeah, so basically uh, when this first strike happens, the lengthwise uh, the blades bend, the blades bend lengthwise and also the widthwise also they bend. So that simulation, in actual simulation, uh, the actual testing and simulation that we saw how they bend basically. And based on that, we came up with this uh, bending design criteria and that's how it was done. Okay, so uh, yeah, so that then uh, we actually uh, send the blades to the testing rig and test it and uh, some of the blades showed the promise. Yeah, some of the promising cases were tried experimentally and found to be promising. Uh, and then uh, this uh, multiple form insert uh, design was filed as a US pattern. 
some of these promising cases may be implemented in the product because uh, 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 by the time it was implemented, uh, I was uh, I left GE. So this is the one of the project that we talked about. Uh, we'll also talk about other project. Uh, but do you have any questions on this uh, previous project? Otherwise, we can uh, move on to second project. Yes, sir. We can have queries in last time. It's better. Okay. All right. Yeah. Then we'll uh, move ahead with the second project. Uh, okay. Uh, I I don't know because uh, this FDB was on nano composite, no? so uh, uh, this work is not based on the nano composite, but it is based on the fiber reinforced composite. Okay. So. Uh, I, I don't know what kind of audience we have here, but uh, this may be interesting to you, all this work. Okay, so second uh, project that we worked on in the industry is uh, studying the plyo drop effect. So what is plyo drop basically? Uh, let me show you, I think. Uh, yeah, I think I have some pictures here, okay. Yeah, what is plyo drop basically? So, so if you look at the laminated composite, okay, so what happens is uh, layer by layer, you build the composite, okay, layer by layer. And then uh, how do you achieve the uh, thickness variation in this uh, laminar composite? So when there's a thickness variation, if it is a constant thickness composite, of course, uh, all the plies will be there. Suppose you are using, let's say 48 plies and uh, all the 48 plies will be there throughout this length uh, for a constant thickness composite. But if the, if the thickness is going to vary, then how do you achieve this uh, thickness variation? So basically you drop the plies. So let's say you have a coupon, you are building a coupon, which is like having a 48 plies at the left end and right end, uh, let's say we have 38 plies. So how do you do that? So of course, some of the plies are going to be dropped along the way, okay? So if you start moving from the left end of the coupon to the right end of the coupon, then of course, some of the plies will get dropped. So plies get dropped means what happens? So if you look at this uh, bottom figure here, uh, as you can see there, so uh, there are a number of plies there. These are all carbon composite and there are a number of plies. So if you look at the center ply, okay, that is getting dropped to achieve the uh, thickness variation. So so if you look at the thickness of this, uh, thickness of the right side and thickness of the left side, that will be slightly different. That will be slightly different because what is happening is one ply is getting dropped. So due to that dropping of the plies, what is happening there? So here, uh, the black region, if you look at the black region uh, in front of this dropped ply, so there is a lot of resin there. So plies are made of basically uh, fibers and resin. So when you drop the ply, it creates the space there. And in that space, a lot of resin is accumulated. So that is called as the resin rich region, uh, which is created due to abrupt ending of the plies. And uh, these are required for, plyo drops are required for achieving thickness variation. Uh, and they act like a structural anomaly inside a perfect structure. As you can see, if you look at the structure, you can see that uh, it lo is looking like a structural anomaly. So the question is, will these anomalies uh, initiate the cracks and delamination failure? Uh, we don't know. So that's what. So uh, the question is to, uh, to perform this study and find out whether it is going to affect uh, the performance of the composite and is it going to... Uh, uh, encourage the uh, delamination cracks and is it going to enable the delamination cracks or uh, how is it going to affect the performance of the composite? So that's what the purpose of this project was. Okay. So, of course, uh, uh, you can actually take this uh, microscopic uh, picture of this uh, plies and you can create the similar model in FTA. So, we'll see that. Okay. How to do that? Okay, so going ahead, uh, application under consideration, of course, again, it was a composite fan blade. So same, same component that we were considering okay, for uh, this study. Uh, this is again a carbon, carbon fiber epoxy laminate composite. Some failures were observed under a strike uh, design criteria. The area highlighted shows the region of failure near trailing region. So uh, if you look at this uh, blade, basically how it is made. So this, this is like a core shape, 
along the length also and along the width also. Both, side, both ways it is curved shape like this, okay? And thickness is varying around the length and around the width also. Uh, this left side, which is shining here, that's a metal cap, okay? So why do, why do they put the metal cap there? Because uh, when the bird hits, okay? So this is the edge that is going to face the blade. This is the, this is the edge which is at the front side of the uh, engine. And this is a trailing edge. So leading edge and trailing edge. Leading edge means which is at the front side of the engine and trailing edge, which is at the back side of the engine. Okay. So when the bird comes and hits this leading edge, okay, the uh, blade bends in uh, all the direction, like lengthwise and widthwise it bends and sometimes it uh, cracks the initiated okay, and cracks initiates and propagates to the failure. So, where they initiate, uh, are they initiating at the prior drops or somewhere else that we need to find out? That's what the study is about. Okay. Most of the elevation cracks seems to originate from the prior drop locations, uh, microscopic, microscopic picture shows. Okay. We need to study this effect of this presence of prior drops in the fan blade material under representative loading conditions like bending and shear. So again, again, we thought like uh, if we uh, like, uh, play around with the prior drops and make the blade every time and test it. So testing the blade will cost like half million dollars. So we cannot do that. So basically, again, the same approach that uh, we have decided to design uh, appropriate coupons with appropriate boundary condition and appropriate loading. And uh, then we'll see whether they really, uh, how they behave under this uh, different uh, design that we have. Let's see. Yeah. So. If you look at this picture here, uh, it shows like uh, left side. It shows like uh, there are no there are no ply drops. All the plies are continuously going there, so no thickness variation. There's a constant thickness, no thickness variation. So this is one example of uh, perfect composite. The second uh, picture shows there is one one ply getting dropped, and the third picture shows there are two plies are getting dropped here. Two plies are getting dropped. So these are the simple uh, designs that uh, we have decided to try. Let's see. Yeah. So approach one. Uh, there was one appro first approach that uh, uh, let's see how how the coupons behave under tension and compression loading. So we have decided to design and make a simple lab coupon with and without prior drop. Prior drops are placed at the critical location. So under tension and compression, how do you achieve this tension and compression? Uh, uh, for the prior drop. So what we do is, uh, I'll show you the picture here. Yeah, yeah, picture. Okay. Picture is shown here. So you may take a coupon like this. Okay, we take a coupon like this, and we'll try to subject the coupon to this uh, standard regular four point bend bond recognition. If you subject the coupon to standard regular four point bend bond recognition, then what happens is coupon is going to bend like this. Coupon is going to bend like this. If coupon is going to bend like this, okay. So what is going to happen? If you put strain gauges at the bottom uh, edge and the bottom surface and the top surface, of course, you uh, by our mechanics you can tell that uh, the bottom surface is uh, under tension and the top surface is under compression. So by simple bending, you can achieve this uh, uh, tension and compression in the coupon. Okay. So what we'll do is uh, we'll. We have designed coupon in such a way that the coupon uh, there's a ply drop which is near the surface, ply drop which is near the surface, and this surface we can decide whether we can put the ply drop near the uh, surface which is under tension, uh, near the surface which is under compression. So that we can decide. So what we did is we have made the coupons and then first we subjected the coupon to the uh, having coupon which is a place like uh, uh, ply drop near the compression. And in second case, we place the coupon where prior drop is near tension, and then we uh, tested them like how, how they behave like this. Okay. And of course, uh, strain gauges and this uh, A sensor. A sensors is the acoustic emission sensors. So why these uh, sensors are used acoustic emission? Because because if you if you have strain gauges and uh, uh, basically what you do is uh, you plot the uh, load versus strain. Okay, load versus, load versus strain you can obtain. But the problem is the uh, uh, load assist strain plot generally doesn't give you the exact uh, load, exact load when the initiation happened. So this this test basically is designed such a way that you are applying uh, displacement loading, 
and you are measuring the load. Okay, you are applying your displacement loading uh, using UTM, and you are measuring the amount of uh, load uh, that is that is resisting amount of load. Okay, so so basically you are plotting load versus strain, and the plot doesn't really show when the cracks are initiating in the structure. So uh, to talk about this initiation of cracks. So the basically, uh, uh, when any coupon or any uh, blade that is tested, okay, uh, even the blade testing, if you see blade testing, the uh, blade testing happens so fast in a fraction of seconds, okay, and then um, you directly see the pale blade. So you see uh, when you pick up the pale blade and you take under microscope and see that it is having a, a big crack, uh, which is which is initiated from some place and then propagated to somewhere else. Okay, so then basically uh, you don't know when the crack initiation started, at what load it started. So how do you find the uh, crack initiation? That is a big question, okay. So for that, uh, is there any technology available? So what we did is we try to use the acoustic emission sensor. Some of you might be aware of it. So what does it do, acoustic emission sensor? Uh, it actually measures the smallest amount of noise that is or sound that is created in the coupon. Okay, so what happens is uh, wherever uh, wherever some cracks are getting initiated, it may create a very very small uh, noises there or sound, and this uh, these sensors are very very sensitive, so they'll pick up all those uh, sound events. Okay, and uh, then you can actually see uh, uh, over time, like this is a time bound test. Now. So let's say it, it goes on for twenty minutes, so all the twenty minutes you can actually see the sound events. Uh, when the sound events are actually starting and then when the crack propagates, the sound event, uh, more and more sound events come when the crack propagates. So at certain stage, suddenly the sound events uh, starts appearing and then as the crack propagates, the uh, sound events increase like crazy, like uh, exponentially. So that plot also you can do uh, over time, acoustic emission events, and then you can actually find the initiation uh, when the crack initiation happened. So that load level is very, very important when the crack initiation happens. So that we try to find uh, using this. So yeah, going back to this, uh, okay, we will be using perpendicular bend condition and uh, drops are subjected to tensile compressive load by putting them, pressing them uh, near the tensile surface or compressor surface and then measure the failure load. Uh, then after that, you do the simulation for the same load and same boundary condition and same coupons. Uh, measure the stress and levels and compare the stress, stress and strength with and without prior drop case and estimate the effect of presence of prior drop. So this is the approach that we followed. So maybe I'll explain again. Uh, okay, so what we do is uh, we make the coupons, we test them. Uh, coupons are made with and without prior drops. Okay. And then we also go to the simulation and then uh, from the experimentation, we get the uh, initiation failure load. So the initiation failure load we apply there at the end uh, in the APA simulation. And then we see the strain levels occurring there. And those strain levels uh, for the uh, initiation failure load for without, without prior drop coupons and with prior drop coupons. And then we see how much is the difference. So that's what will tell us whether uh, uh, how much effect that uh, uh, presence of prior drop has near the tensile surface or the compression surface. So this is basically to evaluate the prior drop under tension compression. So here uh, again, uh, 16 plies, thick uh, placements were used and uh, they were made of 0 and 45 uh, orientation fibers. Okay. Then there was, uh, this was for the tension compressions like prior drop, which is subjected to tensile and compressive loading. What about shear? So per shear, we design another coupon. So here again, we thought that uh, let's design another coupon, okay? Uh, where we'll, uh, we'll put the plier drop exactly at the location where interlaminal shear is more, uh, like interlaminal shear level is very high. Uh, so we decided to use the short beam shear uh, kind of specimen and use the perpoint bend for short beam shear, okay? So here, plier drop will be subjected to highest level of interlaminal shear load. Then measure the failure load, do the simulations. Again, the same procedure basically, and uh, uh, also measure the initiation failure load using the acoustic emission. And then 
compare this places and same levels with and without prior op, estimate the effect of presence of prior op. So, yeah, so this is what uh, we were doing here. As you can see, uh, this is the short beam shear specimen. Uh, and generally, the short beam shear is uh, done in three. Short beam shear generally is done in uh, three point bend, but we were doing four point bend here. Because we found it more convenient to do here, and uh, because we have enough space for putting the uh, strain gauges and the acoustic emission sensor, so this is the acoustic emission sensor basically. So it measures the uh, uh, number of sound events. Okay, uh, when the testing going on, of course, uh, if the testing goes on for 20 minutes, so for, for first 10 minutes, of course, you will not see anything. When the uh, uh, no sound events, we will see, but. When the crack initiates, suddenly the number of sound events start jumping up, and then after that they increase exponentially. Okay, so this is what the simple setup you can see: uh, four point bend, short beam shear, and uh, this is the region uh, where we wanted to focus because, of course, uh, in this kind of boundary condition, this region will be having a uh, highest uh, interlaminar shear. So, and. Uh, uh, we also like painted this region. Uh, we polished polished the surface of this specimen and painted this region with uh, a special powder. You know, you know, because to monitor it using the digital image correlation. So, what is this uh, digital image uh, correlation technique? Okay. I will explain that. So, a digital image correlation technique is basically uh, you have this very fine powder uh, coated on the surface of the specimen, very fine powder. Okay, or very fine paint that's coated on the surface of the specimen. And then um, there's a camera. Okay, And camera takes the images of that uh, surface like uh, every uh, every few seconds or every milliseconds also is possible. So you can set that camera. So And then um, all those images, like every second you take image suppose. So 20 minutes, you will have like thousands of images. So series of images you will have. So you can take those images in a special, specially developed software. Okay. So there is a vendor who sells that kind of software. So you uh, you take those images and uh, the software will analyze the uh, uh, in-plane strain variations that are occurring there, okay? So what it does is the moment of this, all these particles of paint, okay, uh, along that surface, it, it, it tries to correlate subsequent images, uh, the moment of particle, it tries to correlate to the strain. So of course it has to be calibrated initially, uh, uh, so you calibrate like you give the uh, dimensions of that uh, rectangle, basically painter rectangle initially, and uh, then as the uh, time moves, you can correlate the changes in the dimensions for every particle, and uh, then you can find out the in-plane strain or interlaminar strain or x-direction strain, y-direction strain, and x-y strains. All these three strains you can find uh, the uh, re real strain variations. Uh, Real time strain variations in that surface. This is DIC. So why why are we doing DIC? Again, again goes back to the same question. So uh, as you know, the normal load versus strain cannot tell you uh, when the initiation crack initiation is happening. Okay, that is why uh, we were using trying to use the acoustic emission. But suppose acoustic emission also doesn't work, then what happens? So so parallelly, we'll, we have installed also this uh, digital image correlation. And that also was able to give us the crack initiation time. Basically, uh, in the 20 minutes test, uh, when the crack was initiated. And from that time, you can see the actual load level at which it is initiated. And the same load level, you can actually use in the uh, FE analysis to find out the uh, strain levels. OK, that's what. Uh, so basically, uh, then you will ask me a question like, uh, you are also measuring the strain. Then how do you, uh, why not, why you're not using the strain level as a, uh, at that particular, uh, you know, at that particular load level, we know what is strain. But here, uh, if you look at this uh, strain gauge, which is only telling you the tensile strain here, uh, we don't know what is the interlaminar strain occurring at this, uh, near the prior drop, we don't know. That's why we have to, uh, use this uh, so many sensors here, get the data and go back to APA and validate and then get back the actual strain levels near the prior drop. So as far as the specimens are concerned, you can see the, the 80 plies uh, thick specimens and mostly 0.45 plies and you can see this uh, crack 
cracks were initiated uh, at this location and then propagated to the other end. You can see all these cracks, delamination cracks, you can clearly see. They initiated at this uh, prior drop location and they propagated. So basically, what are we doing here? We are basically, you know, subjecting this uh, prior drop locations to maximum amount of stress, whether it's a tensile stress or it's a compressive stress or it's inflammatory stress. So we are artificially subjecting this prior drop to maximum amount of stress and then seeing whether what is the effect of that and comparing with the specimens without prior drops. So as you can see here, uh, again, the same configuration. Uh, this is the short beam shear and strain gauges and uh, some surface which is painted with this uh, very fine paint to, to capture the images using TIC. So uh, then uh, along the way, we also try to validate this, uh, that load, load versus strain plot that we are getting from the experiment using the FEA. And, uh, of course, there's a different question uh, because APA can give you only uh, straight part validation, but to have the damage vari validation, how to do it? So we were using this coage zone modeling to get this uh, damage part also, and that was matching very well. Excuse me, sir. Sorry to yes. interrupt. There's more distance coming from my definitely the additional my points. Definitely. Yes, what is your question? I am not able to hear. Yes, there is a uh, condition is coming in. Otherwise, uh, it's not uh, continuous. No, no, I can't hear uh, the question properly. Can you type it? Uh, then I'll read the question. Maybe you can yeah. type in type the question in the chat. Okay. Maybe it's it. a low internet connection. You can off the video, sir. You can off the video. Okay, so next. Yeah, so uh, as far as the failure failure load is concerned under this uh, short beam shear testing, okay? So you can see that uh, uh, average of five specimens or six specimens, like uh, what it's showing is uh, there, there are specimens without any prior drop inside. It's a constant thickness specimen without any prior drops. And uh, there is a specimen with a single prior drop located at that uh, highest possible uh, interlaminar shear stress point. And also there is a, a double prior drop, like two priors dropping at the location where max, maximum interlamellar shear is occurring. So you can see the difference in the failure loads, okay? So of course the failure load is different, but this is the final ultimate failure load, okay? So what we were interested in, we were interested in the uh, initiation failure load. And that was very difficult to obtain, but we were able to obtain using the acoustic emission and uh, also this uh, 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 DIC. Why, why are we interested in the initiation failure load? Because uh, what happens is uh, ultimate failure load is not the real indicator of failure. Uh, you can't really uh, you know, depend on ultimate failure uh, when it's happening, okay, uh, failure load. So as you can see here, the, if it's saying here that uh, specimen is failing at 30,500, you cannot design the blade uh, accordingly like uh, on this ultimate failure load. So we have to find out when the cracks are initiating. That is very, very important in case of the critical components like a fan blade, where uh, we cannot afford to you know, have any kind of initiation also. So that's why the design should be based on the initiation uh, failure load. Okay, so as far as this, uh, uh, I was talking about this DIC. So what we try to do is uh, at those initiation uh, load levels, we try to compare this uh, AP was a DIC plot and uh, they were comparing a very well range, like uh, what is happening near the prior. Of course, of course, there's a prior drop in this region. That's why uh, DIC was showing all this strain concentration. Here also there was a prior drop. That's why it's showing the strain concentration. Similarly, in the AP also there's a prior drop and that's why it was showing this strain concentration. So we, try, we were trying to capture this uh, AP was a DIC. And then, of course, uh, as far as the uh, strain allowables are concerned, how do you find the uh, effect of this prior drop? So as you can see, the baseline coupon uh, uh, and then prior drop, single prior drop coupon, uh, double prior drop coupons uh, like this. So you can see the difference of this uh, interlaminar shear strains. Okay. Uh, yeah, so this is based on the ultimate failure load, and this is based on the initiation failure load. 
Okay. So this is what it shows. Like uh, there's a big difference between the initiation failure, uh, initiation strain, uh, initiation failure load strain, and the ultimate failure strain. You can see the big difference there. And also you can see the prior drop effect. So almost like it's changing uh, by let's say 10 percent. That the comparison I'll show you later, like how much it affects. So failure, of course, we saw that uh, uh, in Schwabium shear, the failure was uh, basically directly delamination type of failure. And uh, in the earlier coupon that I uh, showed you where dry drop is located near the surface, and uh, we were subjecting it to tension or compression. So that failure was uh, something different. That failure was like fiber breakage at the compression site. Okay. So here the fiber was breaking at the compression, compression site. Okay, so uh, this was about the uh, single prior drop and uh, double prior drop coupon. So suppose, uh, but in reality, if you look at the uh, real applications, you can see that there are a uh, number of structures, but uh, they won't have like single prior drop or double prior drop, they will have multiple prior drops. So how about we uh, design the coupon with a multiple prior drop? So what we did is we try to design coupons with multiple prior drops, okay. Uh, so, First, we try to design the coupons with, uh, I'll show you the pictures actually, rather than this uh, text. Uh, yeah, where is that? Yeah, here. Yeah. As you can see, the possible designs. So first we tried the coupons, you know, with uh, prior drops located at the mid thickness. Okay. So if you look at the prior drops at the mid thickness and then try to bend it or uh, maybe if you try to set up like a cantilever testing, okay, try to bend it. So this this prior drops will be along the neutral axis, and of course they will not have any effect on the structure. Uh, they will not have any effect on the structure because they will be at the uh, neutral axis if you bend them. Then uh, there is another design where, as you can see, uh, there are two more designs are there. Here the uh, prior drops are located near the surface, but they are in series like this. And here the prior are located near the surface, but they are not in series. They are in a zigzag arrangement like this. Okay. So all these cases that we tried, and also uh, these three cases were repeated for like fiber direction transfers to the length and fiber direction around the length. Okay. Like fibers are ori uh, oriented around the length and across the length like this. So okay. And uh, this is actually this is this coupon is uh, designed like. Uh, a tapered coupon because as you know there are many price uh, dropping so basically uh, from 40th price at the left end to the 30th price at the right end so basically 10 price are dropping along the length okay so that's why it's, i'll show you here where that yeah this is the coupon here as you can see the thickness is varying uh, for this coupon okay so left end there are uh, 40 applies and they're dropping at 30 applies at the right end. So there are many plies uh, dropping around the lane. So this is a specimen with the multiple ply drops inside. Okay. And uh, of course we are using the strain gauges and we designed some special picture for cantilever kind of loading because uh, we want to see the effect of this uh, multiple plies near the surface. So as we have seen in the earlier study, uh, near the surface plies are uh, very, very you know sensitive to uh, failure. So uh, we decided to subject this uh, drop near the surface to the tension or compression. So this kind of setup is the best to subject them to tensile and compressive stresses. So when it bends, the bottom surface is uh, subjected to compression, top surface is to tension like this. And this is a special loading uh, picture that we designed so that uh, we can achieve this bending. Yeah, so basically, uh, yeah, de design and make the coupons with and without prior drops uh, located at mid thickness. Then uh, design make open with multiple priors located at near the surface and in series. And the uh, third one was of course located near the surface but zigzag manner. Uh, again, we are using the cantilever boundary condition, uh, measure the failure loads and apply similar loads to coupons, measure stress and strain levels near the prior application and compare them for with and without prior cases. Okay, so <clears throat> Estimate the reason allowable. So we'll show you what happens in general. Yeah, so cantilever kind of setup was used. Uh, this is uh, first setup, first picture of the setup. Okay, 
is a special picture. What we did is uh, we took that bending picture stand and uh, we kind of install another picture there, which can hold up the specimen and then you can bend like this. And uh, application of load is achieved through this wedge shaped uh, uh, picture here. And it is to apply the load on the specimen. So this is another picture of the setup. Yeah, this is one. This one we talked about. So yeah, what are the difference between the, the case two and case three? As you can see, uh, prior of equal distance from the outer surface. So basically, what is happening is uh, you have a variable thickness uh, specimen here. So as you can see, the left end is like uh, forty-eight plies, and right end is like uh, thirty-eight plies, and the plies are getting dropped along the way. And this is a multiple ply specimen. So there will be like uh, 10 plies are dropping from 48 to 38. So we can design the coupon like uh, five plies are dropping at the top and five plies are dropping at the bottom. So total uh, 10 plies are dropping. So we'll have 48 at the left end and 38 plies at the right end. So, but when the, when the plies are getting dropped, so if they are like equidistance from the surface, so this is the one case, design case. And other design case, what we did is, so we were dropping the plies, but in a different way. As you can see, here the topmost plies are dropped first, and then consecutively they are dropped. Here is different. Here the uh, middlemost plies are dropped first, and then other plies drop like this. Okay. So this is another design. So this also we tried. So what what is the difference here? See, all the plies are near the surface here. Now here all the plies are all the ply drops are near the surface. Here all the ply drops are not near the surface. Like this ply drop is near the surface. This ply drop is near, but other ply drops are getting away from the surface. Uh, while in this case, all the ply drops are near the surface. So these are the different things that we tried. Yeah, so of course, uh, uh, one one set of the cases was proper direction normal to the length, the other set of the cases was uh, proper direction along the length. And then uh, we saw that case one, case two, case three. Case one is of course like a uh, baseline case because the prior drop location is at the middle thickness. So it's not gonna affect any uh, performance. So of course case two and case three should show the different result. And that's what happened here. You can see the uh, lower low assist uh, strain plots where you can see uh, case two and case three brown and red. They're showing the different results here compared to case one. Uh, also, set B where power direction was along the length. Here also we show uh, case two and case three results are showing on a different uh, lower levels, better lower levels. Yeah. And of course, we can see the uh, tabulated charts for the test results. Uh, these are the failure loads and average and standard deviation. And then uh, ultimately, what we show here is if you compare case one and case two, okay. So case one average failure load is uh, 801 and case two average failure load is, this is ultimate failure load, not initiation, okay, ultimate failure load. So case one shows the ultimate failure load of 801, case two shows the average ultimate failure load of 623. So if you compare this thing, so you get a drop of almost 22% in failure load. Okay, just, just why this drop is there? Just by changing the location of prior drops. So the location of prior drop is very, very important. So when you design any structure with prior drops, so this factor has to be come into importance. And uh, that's what we did this uh, design space study that if you have a different location of prior drop, how it's going to affect. So here also, if you see the case three, it's showing like 12% drop from the failure load. Okay. Uh, drop in the same, they are failing earlier than these coupons. Okay, so these coupons are good, but these coupons are failing earlier than these coupons, which is not good. So then what to do basically, then you have to play around with the designs like this coupon design, uh, fiber drop design. So fiber direction uh, along the length, there also you see it is like 4%, 4.7% drop, 12% drop in these cases. And uh, this picture shows uh, how it was failed. Uh, case one was the fiber breakage observed near the compression surface. Then case two is the crack initiation near the prior drop and then delamination propagating surface. So as you can see, uh, 
uh, crack initiation happening near the prior drop and then prior drop to prior drop is jumping actually. As you can see, one prior drop to another prior drop is jumping and going to the surface. In the third case, uh, crack initiation near the prior drop and then delamination propagation here. For the uh, state B, state B here, you can see uh, case one is compression side fiber breakage. Case two is uh, prior drop to prior drop delam crack propagation, as you can see. And crack, third, third case is uh, crack initiation near prior drop, then delamation propagation surface. So basically, uh, uh, crack is initiating somewhere and then propagating to the surface. Okay. Uh, set A, set B, of course, I explained that uh, set A is zero degree fibers transverse to the length, and set B is the zero degree fibers parallel to length. So, mid thickness location of prior drops in both cases, uh, S1 compression power breakage. Okay. Hence, no effect on the parallel strain. Other cases uh, shows uh, much more prominent as the lamb jumps from one prior drop to the other. I'll show you one nice picture, I think, that we got for uh, crack jump. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we, we try to take uh, images of this uh, crack propagation of the inside the surface, and then we kind of attach them together. And then you can actually uh, very nicely see that uh, uh, crack is initiating at one prior drop, and then it is going to the other prior drop and jumping to the next ply. And then it's going to the another prior drop and again jumping. Then it's going to the another prior drop and jumping like this. So it's very interesting, like uh, prior drop to prior drop, how it jumps. Why it is occurring like that? Because if you remember what I showed in the, yeah, here. So as you can see, uh, either they can jump from prior drop to prior drop or they can jump here also, prior drop to prior drop and goes to surface. So all the cracks uh, initiate somewhere near the prior drop and then they have a tendency to go to the surface. So they have a tendency to propagate to the next prior drop so that they can go to the surface like this. This is what is interesting things are happening there. Like this, yeah, this is what I showed you. Okay, so ultimately to summarize uh, this uh, prior drop uh, you know, uh, testing that we did and analysis and testing that we did. So as you can see, uh, if you normalize the values, uh, let's say for baseline specimen without prior drop, uh, you have, let's say 1% strain. So normalizing this basically. Uh, under sharpened shear and failure uh, mode is interlaminate shear, test is uh, sharpened shear. And if you take the uh, uh, another baseline specimen for uh, four point bend and compressive kind of compressive power break is kind of failure. And uh, let's say the uh, strain allowable is again normalized to 1%. Then how, how do you compare all these cases? So single prior drop and multiple prior drop uh, under different conditions. Single prior drop under sharpened shear and under four point bend. If you compare, then uh, compared to this 1%, the strain level is 0 0.94, 0 0.94. What does it mean? It means uh, uh, the specimen with single prior drop inside is going to fail at 0.94% uh, strain as compared to the baseline specimen, which will fail at 1%. So presence of prior drop is making a difference. So it is, if prior drop is present, it is going to fail early. And how much early? It is going to fail like uh, almost, uh, 0.06% strain early. Okay. Similarly, uh, for multiple prior drops also, we can see that uh, under the cantilever condition and ILS kind of failure, we can see that uh, it is going to uh, strain allowable could be like 0 0.83 and 0 0.94. Means this, if you compare with the baseline specimen, the difference is almost like 17%. Uh, 1% to 0.83 is like almost 17%. So in multiple prior drop specimens, uh, the specimens are going to fail because of presence of multiple prior drops uh, by even as high as 17% earlier in terms of uh, failure strain. Okay. So this is what this is what it shows. Uh, and the lower load average specimen fails in test, major strain levels near the prior drops in FE. Yeah, this is what we did like basically, as I told you earlier that uh, uh, we don't directly take the initiation strain data from this uh, testing. So what we do is we take the test failure load and also try to get this initiation failure load. We go back to the APA and check the strain levels there. Okay. So as high as 17% difference can be obtained. Okay. 
yeah so conclusions uh, this was like a important uh, basic exercise to compute the effect of presence of firewalls in compute structures under different kinds of loading and under certain loading conditions there could be as large as 20% drop in spin allowables okay. so this study can help in coming up with design allowable for ss composites and be a part of design handbook for specific materials under specific loading so uh, sorry there is a typo there but yeah uh that's what it means uh, this was a very general study which is not only applicable to the composite fan blade but it can be also applicable to any other uh, composite structures in aerospace industry because this was done uh, using carbon composites carbon composites the general uh, general general it is used in aerospace composites for the scope so that's why i'm saying it was done specifically for uh, iam7 8551 and a specific layup where it can be expanded to other possibilities like uh, maybe for glass fiber maybe for uh, different kind of carbon fiber epoxy okay so this is what i have today so now i am uh, open to answering the questions uh, is there any question from the chat oh, i don't see any oh, there let me see Yes, if anybody has queries, you can post in the chat box so that uh, Sir will answer. So you can raise your hands. I will make you unmute. Yes. So this was mostly about fiber and post composite. So I don't know whether it is relevant to you directly to some of the researchers here, but uh, yeah, it's quite interesting study. So yeah, the participants, you can unmute yourself and you can yes. ask the questions now. Sir, sir, good afternoon, sir. Ah uh, yes, good afternoon. Uh, sir, this is uh, Dr. Madhusudan, sir, uh, from. Uh, ఉషారమ్మ కాలేజ్ ఆఫ్ ఇంజనీరింగ్ అండ్ టెక్నాలజీ ఆంధ్రప్రదేశ్ విజయవాడ సార్ నైస్ టు హ్యావ్ యూ అవర్ ప్రెసెంటేషన్ సార్ ఐ గాన్ త్రూ యువర్ ఎంటైర్ ప్రెసెంటేషన్ సార్ ఐ హ్యావ్ ఐ హ్యావ్ వన్ ఆర్ టూ క్వశ్చన్స్ ఫర్ క్లారిఫికేషన్ సార్ ది ఫ్లై డ్రాప్ ఈజ్ ఈజ్ ఇంటెన్షనల్లీ మేడ్ టు డిక్రీస్ ది స్ట్రెయిన్ ఆర్ ఫర్ ఎనీ అదర్ పర్పస్ ఓకే సార్ ఫర్ థిక్నెస్ వేరియేషన్ దేర్ ఇస్ నో ఆల్టర్నేటివ్ బట్ టు గో ఫర్ ది ఫ్లై డ్రాప్ okay basically if you want to vary the thickness in any composite structure the yes, plies sir. need to drop because a laminated composite is made with plies so for thickness variation we have no other option but to drop the plies okay okay so for that purpose uh, we drop the plies but what we are trying to study here is uh, if we drop the plies in a certain way or some other way uh, it is going to have a different effect Uh, what about the strength and uh, sustainability sir uh, if you go for a ply drop yeah so uh, uh, yeah of course um, that's what i we try to calculate if you compare the coupons without ply drop and with ply drops of course it's going to show something different uh, like uh, for example strain is going to be drop uh, maximum 10 to 15% it can also drop so 10 to 15 variations is there 10 to 15% so what what we are proposing that uh, when we design this uh, any aerospace composite structure uh, before design itself we should uh, consider this allowable that uh, that because of presence of ply drop that uh, this structure may fail at 0.9% strain instead of the 1% strain that they generally use so this this should be used uh, before even you start the design that this allowable has to be considered like a factor of safety basically you know factor of safety what is factor of safety Okay. So, factor of safety is like uh, we already incorporate the factor of safety to uh, uh, to allow for many things. So, similarly, uh, when you go for design of any aerospace structure, uh, we are recommending that at least 10% percent allowable should be already considered before even you design something, uh, okay. any structure with prior. Okay. So, we can design the uh, component. Uh, Mm-hmm. Uh, by adopting the ply drop concept uh, yes, yes, so but end, end point of view is only to decrease the thickness yeah, yeah. i mean and if you want to have a very variable thickness then you have to use uh, structure with the ply drop is fine 
but uh, you should be aware that uh, the failure generally occurs like 10% uh, 10% strain earlier okay so 10% strain level earlier that's what okay so if if, if generally a carbon compound structure fails at let's say 1% strain the carbon compound structure with prior drop will fail around 0.9% strain so that you should be aware okay so uh, it is not only for aerospace sir for any other components also we can implement this concept Oh, yes, 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 it can be done for, uh, no, we were doing for that aerospace application, but I think uh, for uh, for general applications also it can be done. Uh, but uh, but what happens is uh, for general application, is, it is not that critical uh, under, uh, yeah, in aerospace it is very, very critical because yeah. even if like, it draws by 5% or let's say 2%, uh, it fails like 2% strain before uh, than expected. Then it makes a huge difference in aerospace, uh, not in general applications. Yes, sir. Sir, I have one, one more last question, sir. Uh, if at all, if you want to go for this pride of uh, manufacturing, uh, what type of manufacturing method we can adopt, sir? So this particular thing that we did uh, uh, was for uh, was uh, like autoclave and hand layup. Uh, we bought the prepeg, prepegs and then we laid them up and, uh, and uh, then we uh, cured them in autoclave and then we cut the panels. But actually, I, I believe that it can be done in simple water also. Like uh, you buy the plies and do simple vacuum assisted resin transfer molding. It can be done, I think. It can be done. I think there is a literature available on this. Uh, some of the people have uh, manufactured the specimens using uh, simple vacuum assisted resin transfer molding, uh, specimens with prior drops and without prior drops. And, and they did some study. Okay. so. Economical way means it will be through RTM or maybe auto yes, yes. RTM is uh, very cheap. Yeah, RTM. Actually, I uh, I wanted to do this, but uh, I was looking for some uh, uh, resin transfer uh, RTM kind of facility nearby who can do it, okay. uh, and then I can test it because I have a UTM, so I can test it. But uh, I don't have manufacturing facility as such, so okay. that was pending. Okay. Uh, right, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for your. Uh, okay. Thank you. Any other question? Yeah, I think uh, nobody has a uh, query for me. Uh, like, uh, yes. Yes, uh, Mano, who is talking? Can you be a bit louder? Francis, uh, I think you are having a question. Francis, are you there? Please unmute yourself uh, yes. and you can ask. Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, yes. Uh, why the name you call it as coupons? Uh, normally, we used to say a sample or a, a specimen, something like that. But here you are uh -huh. specifically mentioning coupon. Uh, yes. So, so, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I know uh, sample generally comes from the uh, very small size uh, uh, whatever you have, like uh, it comes from the material science basically, sample. But coupons, why we are trying to call it coupons? Because, uh, uh, you, you know, ASTM standards for fiber inference composite. So they generally uh, specify like this coupons only. Uh, if, if you are aware of the ASTM standards for uh, composite testing, tensile testing or comp compression testing or uh, interlamellar shear testing. So those standards specify as a coupon. So they also specify the dimensions of the coupon that you can test. Okay, so that's why. Okay. Yeah. So it's a structural testing basically, uh, like uh, you are measuring the strength of the coupons uh, uh, under tens tension, compression, and shear. So it's a structural testing. So better to call them coupon than sample. Sample generally come from the material science that I know. Yes, sir. Yes. First time I'm hearing this uh, coupon. That's why I'm asking. Thank you. Uh -huh. sir, so, sorry for the interruption, sir. This is Dr. Madhusudan again. Yes. Uh, when you go for this uh, composite testing, uh, different uh, testing uh, specification, 
Even mm-hmm. the textbook also mentions that off-axis coupon test, plus or minus 45 off-axis mm-hmm. coupon test. Yeah. Yeah. So I think probably you are more appropriate to use the coupon from the uh, standard textbook point of view also. Mm, yeah, off access coupon test also is uh, sometimes it is used. Yes, sir. But uh, our, our case, that is about, uh, you're talking about in plane shear. Yes. But ours was interlamellar shear, which is auto plane shear. Yes. So that's why we were mostly focusing on interlamellar rather than in plane shear. Yes, sir. Right. Because for laminated composites, uh, uh, weakest point is interlamellar shear. Yes. Sir. Uh, that's where we are focusing on interlamellar shear. So my email address is given there. If anybody has any interest in this work, uh, of course you can contact me. Any more questions? No, madam. Okay, thank you then. Thank you. Sir, thank you very much, sir, on behalf of uh, MLR Institute of Technology, our HOD, Dr. Gupta, sir, and our principal, Dr. Uh, K. Srinivas, sir, and the entire team of uh, Aero Department. I would like thank to you. heartily con- uh, thank you for taking out your time and uh, giving us a live practical uh, presentation, sir. I thank hope the participants much. are also enjoyed so much. Okay, thank you very much for thank the opportunity. You. Yes, sir. So we are also meeting tomorrow again okay. for the session. Yeah, so for the participants, those who have queries, uh, tomorrow also, sir, will be available. You can uh, just pose your questions to sir in case if you have any. Okay. Thank you, okay. sir. Thank you. I can log out then. Yeah. Yes. So the next session for tomorrow is uh, at 9.45 in the morning. If you have already taken up with the WhatsApp uh, link, please let me know if you have not uh, joined the WhatsApp group because I'm sending the YouTube link, feedback form, everything on WhatsApp. I can send it in the Telegram group or anywhere or to your mails, but unnecessary, everybody starts joining it. Those who are not attending it also. Hope you understand and uh, kindly cooperate with us. Uh, And also the feedback link has been shared in the chat box. I request everyone to kindly fill up the feedback form. It's uh, there, ma'am. Deepak uh, is there, sir. Deepak, sir. Feedback link is available. Yes, madam. Yes, it is available, madam. Yeah. So, uh, if not, please watch the YouTube uh, session. If you are watching the YouTube session, it is easy. And also, you will be having a quiz on Saturday on these sessions. So, which... Uh, you have to score a minimum percentage in that quiz to get the certificate. When, when so please do not. Conducted, madam? Uh, sir, it will be conducted on Saturday, sir. Uh, it means after the to, uh, second session? Or, uh... Yeah, uh, after the second session. Okay. Because uh, this Saturday, one quiz, and the next Saturday, one quiz. Two weeks, two quizzes will be there, and you have to get an average score of minimum 70% in that. Then only the certificate will be provided from the ASCT. I mean, we received it because this is ASCT, this thing, no? That's the reason. So that's the reason. Asking you questions. Are you see, watching the YouTube or not? Are you with this or not, Bolke? So please, uh, in the WhatsApp group, I have uh, posted the videos also. Please do watch them. Uh, Pandya ji, uh, you you are not in the WhatsApp group. Up uh, present nahi
I'm just posting the WhatsApp group link also. And tomorrow also, uh, this uh, Dr. Prakash Jada sir will speak. Uh, tomorrow, our uh, second session, we are having uh, Prakash sir. I think you have seen the profile, right? I have sent in the group also. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yeah. Uh, I don't know who was talking, but I just replied. At myself, Dr. Madhusudan, madam. Uh, Dr. Madhusudan, sir. Okay, okay. I, I even, uh, I am available in video also. Video also I opened. Yeah, I, I'm able to see you. I'm able okay, to I see you. <laughs> so with this, I conclude the session for today. And I sincerely thank my colleagues, Manideep Gupta, sir, Deepika, ma'am, Uday Ranjan Gaud, Nagrachar for being the backup, those who are all in the session. Thank, thank you. you very much, sir. Thank you, Sweta, ma'am, for giving an opportunity. Thank you, one and all. Welcome. Welcome, sir. So please fill the feedback form. I'll... Uh, I have to stop the screen.